Book One of Lives of the Eminent Philosophers by Diogenes Laertes. This translation was published in the Loeb Classical Library in 1925. Book One Prologue. There are some who say that the study of philosophy had its beginning among the barbarians. They urge that the Persians have had their magi, the Babylonians or Assyrians their Chaldeans, and the Indians their gymnosophists. And among the Celts and Gauls there are people called Druids, or Holy Ones, for which they cite as authorities the Magicus of Aristotle and Sotion in the 23rd book of his Succession of Philosophers. Also they say that Mochus was a Phoenician, Zamoxes a Thracian, and Atlas, a Libyan. If we believe the Egyptians, Hephaestus was the son of the Nile, and with him philosophy began, priests and prophets being its chief exponents. Hephaestus lived 48,863 years before Alexander of Macedon, and in the interval there occurred 373 solar and 832 lunar eclipses. The date of the Magians, beginning with Zoroaster the Persian, was 5,000 years before the fall of Troy as given by Hermodorus the Platonist in his work on mathematics. But Xantus, the Lydian, reckoned 6,000 years from Zoroaster to the expedition of Xerxes. And after that event, he places a long line of Magians in succession, bearing the names of Ostanus, Astrompsychos, Gobrius, and Pazatus, down to the conquest of Persia by Alexander. These authors forget that the achievements which they attribute to the barbarians belong to the Greeks, with whom not merely philosophy, but the human race itself began. For instance, Musaeus is claimed by Athens, Linus by Thebes. It is said that the former, the son of Eumolpus, was the first to compose a genealogy of the gods and to construct a sphere, and that he maintained that all things proceed from unity and are resolved again into unity. He died at Phalerum, and this is his epitaph. Musaeus, to his sire Eumolpus dear, in Falerian soil lies buried here. And the Amapodae at Athens get their name from the father of the Musaeus. Linus again was, so it is said, the son of Hermes and the muse Urania. He composed a poem describing the creation of the world, the chorus of the sun and moon, and the growth of animals and plants. His poem begins with the line, Time was when all things grew up at once. And this idea was borrowed by Anaxagoras when he declared that all things were originally together until mind came and set them in order. Linus died in Obeah, slain by the arrow of Apollo, and this is his epitaph. Here Theban Linus, whom Urania bore, the fair-crowned muse, sleeps on a foreign shore. And thus it was from the Greeks that philosophy took its rise. Its very name refuses to be translated into foreign speech. But those who attribute its invention to barbarians bring forward Orpheus the Thracian, calling him a philosopher of whose antiquity there can be no doubt. Now considering the sort of things he said about the gods, I hardly know whether he ought to be called a philosopher. For what are we to make of one who does not scruple to charge the gods with all human suffering, and even the foul crimes wrought by the tongue amongst a few of mankind? The story goes that he met his death at the hands of women, but according to the epitaph of Dium, in Macedonia, he was slain by a thunderbolt. It runs as follows. Here have the muses laid their minstrel true, the Thracian Orpheus, whom Jove's thunder slew. But the advocates of the theory that philosophy took its rise among barbarians go on to explain the different forms it assumed in different countries. As to the gymnosophists and druids, we are told that they uttered their philosophy in riddles, bidding men to reverence the gods, to abstain from wrongdoing, and to practice courage. That the gymnosophists at all events despise even death itself is affirmed by Clitarchus in his twelfth book. He also says that the Chaldeans apply themselves to astronomy and forecasting the future, while the Magi spend their time in the worship of the gods, in sacrifices and in prayers, implying that none but themselves have the ear of the gods. They propound their views concerning the being and origin of the gods, whom they hold to be fire, earth, and water. They condemn the use of images, and especially the error of attributing to the divinities differences of sex. They hold the discourse of justice and deem it impious to practice cremation, but they see no impiety in marriage with a mother or daughter, as Sotion relates in his 23rd book. Further, they practice divination and forecast the future, declaring that the gods appear to them in visible form. Moreover, 
They say that the air is full of shapes which steam forth like vapor and enter the eyes of keen-sighted seers. They prohibit personal ornament and the wearing of gold. Their dress is white. They make their bed on the ground and their food are vegetables, cheese, and coarse bread. Their staff is a reed and their custom is, so we are told, to stick it into the cheese and take up with it the part they eat. With the art of magic they were wholly unacquainted, according to Aristotle in his Magicus and Dinon in the fifth book of his history. Dinon tells us the name of Zoroaster, literally interpreted, means star worshipper, and Hermodorus agrees with him in this. Aristotle in the first book of his dialogue on philosophy declares that the Magi are more ancient than the Egyptians, and further, that they believe in two principles, the good spirit and the evil spirit. The one called Zeus, or Oromastes, the other Hades, or Arimanius. This is confirmed by Hermippus in his first book about the Magi, Eudoxus in his Voyage Round the World, and Theopopus in the eighth book of his Philippica. The last named author says that according to the Magi, men will live in a future life and be immortal, and that the world will endure through their invocations. This is again confirmed by Eudemius of Rhodes. But Hecateus relates that according to them, the gods are subjected to birth. Clearchus of Soli in his tract On Education further makes the gymnosophists to be a descendant from the Magi, and some trace the Jews also to the same origin. Furthermore, those who have written about the Magi criticize Herodotus. They urge that Xerxes would never have cast javelins at the sun, nor have let down fetters into the sea, since in the creed of the Magi, sun and sea are gods. But that statues of the gods should be destroyed by Xerxes was natural enough. The philosophy of the Egyptians is described as follows, so far as relates to the gods and to justice. They say that matter was the first principle. Next, the four elements were derived from matter, and thus living things of every species were produced. The sun and the moon are gods bearing the names of Osiris and Isis respectively. They make use of the beetle, dragon, the hawk, and other creatures as symbols of divinity. According to Manetho in his Epitome of Physical Doctrines, and Hecateus in the first book of his work On the Egyptian Philosophy, they also set up statues and temples to these sacred animals because they do not know the true form of the deity. They hold that the universe is created and perishable, and that it is spherical in shape. They say that the stars consist of fire, and that, according as the fire in them is mixed, so events happen upon earth. That the moon is eclipsed when it falls into the earth's shadow, that the soul survives death and passes into other bodies, that rain is caused by change in the atmosphere, of all other phenomena they give physical explanations, as related by Hecateus and Aristagoras. They also lay down laws on the subject of justice, which they ascribe to Hermes, and they defied those animals which are serviceable to man. They also claim to have invented geometry, astronomy, and arithmetic, thus much concerning the invention of philosophy. But the first to use the term and to call himself a philosopher, or lover of wisdom, was Pythagoras. For, said he, no man is wise but God alone. Heraclides of Pontus, in his De Mortua, makes him say this at Sicyon in conversation with Leon, who was the prince of that city, or Aphleus. All too quickly the study was called wisdom and its professor a sage, to denote his attainment of mental perfection, while the student, who took it up as a philosopher or a lover of wisdom. Sophists was another name for the wise men, and not only for philosophers but for poets also. And so Cratinus, when praising Homer and Hesiod in his Archilochi, gives him the title of Sophist. The men who were commonly regarded as sages were the following. Thales, Solon, Periander, Cleobulus, Chilon, Bias, Pittacus. To these are added Anacarsus the Scythian, Pherecides of Cyros, Epimenides the Cretan, and by some even Pisistratus the Tyrant. So much for the sages or wise men. But philosophy, the pursuit of wisdom, has had a twofold origin. It started with Anaximander on the one hand, with Pythagoras on the other. The former was a pupil of Thales. Pythagoras was taught by Pherecides. The one school was called Ionian, because Thales, a Milesian, and therefore an Ionian, instructed Anaximander. The other school was called Italian, from Pythagoras, who worked for the most part in Italy. And the one school, that of Ionia, terminates with Clitomachus and Chrysippus and Theophrastus, that of Italy with Epicurus. 
The succession passes from Thales through Anaximander, Anaximenes, Anaxagoras, Archelaus to Socrates, who introduced ethics or moral philosophy, from Socrates to his pupils, the Socratics, and especially to Plato, the founder of the old academy. From Plato through Specifus and Xenocrates, the succession passes to Polemo, Crantor, and Crates, Archisalaus, founder of the middle academy, Lacaides, founder of the new academy, Carneades, and Clitomachus. This line brings us to Clitomachus. There is another which ends with Chrysippus, that is to say, by passing from Socrates to Antisthenes, then to Diogenes the Cynic, Crates of Thebes, Zeno of Citium, Cleantes, Chrysippus. And yet again, another one ends with Theophrastus. Thus, from Plato it passes to Aristotle, and from Aristotle to Theophrastus. In this manner, the school of Ionia comes to an end. In the Italian school, the order of succession is as follows. First, Pherecydes, next, Pythagoras. Next, his son, Telauges, then Xenophanes, Parmenides, Zeno of Elea, Leucippus, Democritus, who had many pupils, in particular, Nausiphanes, who were teachers of Epicurus. Philosophers may be divided into dogmatists and skeptics. All those who make assertions about things assuming that they can be known are dogmatists, while all who suspend their judgment on the ground that things are unknowable are skeptics. Again, some philosophers left writings behind them, while others wrote nothing at all. As was the case according to some authorities with Socrates, Stilpo, Philippus, Menedemus, Pyrrho, Theodorus, Carneades, Bryson, some at Pythagoras and Aristo of Chios, except that they wrote a few letters. Others wrote no more than one treatise each, as Melissus, Parmenides, and Exagoras. Many works were written by Zeno, more by Xenophanes, more by Democritus, more by Aristotle, more by Epicurus, and still more by Chrysippus. Some schools took their name from cities, as the Aeleans and the Megarians, the Eritreans and the Cyrenaics. Others from localities, as the Academics and the Stoics. Others from incidental circumstances, as the Peripatetics. Others again from derisive nicknames, as the Cynics. Others from their temperaments, as the Eudaimonists or Happiness School. Others from conceit they entertained, as truth lovers, refutationists, and reasoners from analogy. Others again from their teachers, as Socratics, Epicureans, and the like. Some take the name of physicists from their investigation of nature. Others that of moralists, because they discuss morals, while those who are occupied with verbal jugglery are styled dialecticians. Philosophy has three parts, physics, ethics, and dialectic, or logic. Physics is the part concerned with the universe and all that it contains, ethics that concerned with life and all that has to do with us, while the processes of reasoning employed by both form the province of dialectic. Physics flourished down to the time of Archelaus, ethics, as we have seen, started with Socrates, while dialectic go as far back as Zeno of Elea. In ethics there have been ten schools, the academic, the Cyrenaic, the Elean, the Megarian, the Cynic, the Eritrean, the Dialectic, the Peripatetic, the Stoic, and the Epicurean. The founders of these schools were, of the Old Academy, Plato, of the Middle Academy, Archisalaus, of the New Academy, Lacaides, of the Cyrenaic, Aristippus of Cyrene, of the Elean, Phaedo of Elis, the Megarian, Euclides of Megara, of the Cynic, Antisthenes of Athens, of the Eritrean, Menedemus of Eritrea, of the Dialectical School, Clitomachus of Carthage of the peripatetic Aristotle of Stagira, of the Stoic Zeno of Citium, while the Epicurean school took its name from Epicurus himself. Hippobotus, in his work On Philosophical Sects, declares that there are nine sects, or schools, and gives them in this order. 1. Megarian, 2. Eritrean, 3. Cyrenaic, 4. Epicurean, 5. Anasirian, 6. Theodoran, 7. Zenonian, or Stoic, 8. Old Academic, 9. Peripatetic. He passes over the Cynic, Elean, and Dialectical schools, for as to the Peronians, so indefinite are their conclusions that hardly any authorities allow them to be a sect. Some allow their claim in certain respects, but not in others. It would seem, however, that they are a sect, for we use the term of those who in their attitude to appearance follow or seem to follow some principle and on this ground we should be justified in calling them the skeptics, a sect. But, 
if we are to understand by sect a bias in favor of coherent positive doctrines, they can no longer be called a sect, for they have no positive doctrines. So much for the beginning of philosophy, its subsequent developments, its various parts, and the number of the philosophical sects. One word more. Not long ago, an eclectic school was introduced by Potamo of Alexandria, who made a selection from the tenets of all the existing sects. As he himself states in his Elements of Philosophy, he takes a criteria of truth, one, that by which the judgment is formed, namely, the ruling principle of the soul, two, the instrument used, for instance, the most accurate perception. His universal principles are matter and the efficient cause, quality and place, for that out of which and that by which a thing is made, as well as the quality with which and the place in which it is made, are principles. The end to which he refers all actions is life made perfect in all virtue, natural and advantages of body and environment being indispensable to its attainment. It remains to speak of the philosophers themselves, and in the first place, of Thales. End of Prologue Chapter 1. Thales Herodotus, Durus, and Democritus are agreed that Thales was the son of Examius and Cleobulina, and belonged to the Teledae, who are Phoenicians, and among the noblest of the descendants of Cadmus and Agenor. As Plato testifies, he was one of the seven sages. He was the first who received the name of Sage in the Archonship of Damasius at Athens, when the term was applied to all the seven sages, as Demetrius of Phalera mentions in his List of Archons. He was admitted to citizenship at Miletus when he came to that town along with Neleus, who had been expelled from Phoenicia. Most writers, however, represent him as a genuine Milesian, and of a distinguished family. After engaging in politics, he became a student of nature. According to some, he left nothing in writing, for the nautical astronomy attributed to him is said to be by Focus of Samos. Callimachus knows him as a discoverer of the Ursa Minor, for he says in his iambics, Who first of men the course made plain, of those small stars we call the wane, whereby Phoenicians sail the main. But according to others, he wrote nothing but two treatises, one on the solstice and one on the equinox, regarding all other matters as incognizable. He seems, by some accounts, to have been the first to study astronomy, the first to predict eclipses of the sun and to fix the solstices, so Eudemus in his History of Astronomy. It was this which gained for him the admiration of Xenophanes and Herodotus, and the notice of Heraclitus and Democritus. And some, including Coralus, the poet, declare that he was the first to maintain the immortality of the soul. He was the first to determine the sun's course from solstice to solstice, and according to some, the first to declare the size of the sun to be one seven hundredth and twentieth part of the solar circle, and the size of the moon to be the same fraction of the lunar circle. He was the first to give the last day of the month the name of thirtieth, and the first, some say, to discuss physical problems. Aristotle and Hippias affirm that, arguing from the magnet and from amber, he attributed a soul or life even to inanimate objects. Pamphila states that, having learned geometry from the Egyptians, he was the first to inscribe a right angle triangle in a circle, whereupon he sacrificed an ox. Others tell this tale of Pythagoras, amongst them Apollodorus the arithmetician. It was Pythagoras who developed to the furthest extent the discoveries attributed by Callimachus in his iambics to Euphorbus the Phrygian, I mean scalene triangles, and whatever else has to do with theoretical geometry. Thales is also credited with having given excellent advice on political matters. For instance, when Croesus sent to Miletus offering terms of alliance, he frustrated the plan, and this proved the salvation of the city when Cyrus obtained a victory. Heraclides makes Thales himself say that he had always lived in solitude as a private individual and kept aloof from state affairs. Some authorities say he had married and had a son, Chibistus. Others that he remained unmarried and adopted his sister's son. And that when he was asked why he had no children of his own, he replied, because he loved children. The story is told that when his mother tried to force him to marry, he replied that it was too soon. And when she pressed him again later in life, he replied that it was too late. Hieronymus of Rhodes in the second book of his Scattered Notes relates that, in order to show how easy it is to grow rich, Thales, foreseeing that it would be a good season for olives, rented all the oil mills and thus amassed a fortune. 
His doctrine was that water is the universal primary substance, and that the world is animate and full of divinities. He is said to have discovered the seasons of the year and divided it into 365 days. He had no instructor except that he went to Egypt and spent some time with the priests there. Hieronymus informs us that he measured the height of the pyramids by the shadow they cast, taking the observation at the hour when our shadow is of the same length as ourselves. He lived, as Minius relates, with Thrasybulus, the tyrant of Miletus. The well-known story of the tripod found by the fishermen and sent by the people of Miletus to all the wise men in succession runs as follows. Certain Ionian youths, having purchased of the Milesian fishermen their catch of fish, a dispute arose over the tripod which had formed part of the catch. Finally, the Milesians referred to the question to Delphi, and the god gave an oracle in this form. Who shall possess the tripod, thus replies Apollo, whosoever is most wise. Accordingly, they gave it to Thales, and he to another, and so on, till it comes to Solon, who, with the remark that the god was the most wise, sent it off to Delphi. Callimachus in his iambics has a different version of the story, which he took from Meandrius of Miletus. It is that Bathycles, an Arcadian, left at his death a bull with the solemn injunction that it should be given to him who had done most good by his wisdom. So it was given to Thales, went the round of all the sages, and came back to Thales again. And he sent it to Apollo at Didyma with this dedication, according to Callimachus. Lord of the folks of Neleus's line, Thales of Greeks are judged most wise, brings to thy Didymaean shrine his offering a twice won prize. But the prose inscription is, Thales the Milesian, son of Examius, dedicates this to Delphian Apollo after twice winning the prize from all the Greeks. The bull was carried from place to place by the son of Bathycles, whose name was Tyrion, so it is stated by Ulysses in his work On Achilles, and Alexo the Mindian in the ninth book of his Legends. But Eudoxus of Nidos and Euanthes of Miletus agree that a certain man who was a friend of Croesus received from the king a golden goblet in order to bestow it upon the wisest of the Greeks. This man gave it to Thales, and from him it passed to others, and so to Chilon. Chilon laid the question, Who is a wiser man than I, before the Pythian Apollo? And the god replied, Mycen. Of him we shall have more to say presently. In the list of the seven sages given by Eudoxus, Mycon takes the place of Cleobulus. Plato also includes him by omitting Periander. The answer of the oracle respecting him was as follows. Mycon of Chen in Oeta, this is he, who, for wise-heartedness, surpasseth thee. And it was given in reply to a question put by Anacarsis. Dimachus the Platonist and Clearchus alleged that a bull was sent by Croesus to Pythicus and began the round of the wise men from him. The story told by Andron in his work On the Tripod is that the Argives offered a tripod as a prize of virtue to the wisest of the Greeks. Aristodemus of Sparta was adjudged a winner but retired in favor of Chilon. Aristodemus is mentioned by Alcaeus thus. Surely no witless word was this of the Spartan, I deem. Wealth is the worth of a man and poverty void of esteem. Some relate that a vessel with its freight was sent by Periander to Thrasybulus, tyrant of Miletus, and that when it was wrecked in Cohen waters, the tripod was afterwards found by certain fishermen. However, Phanoticus declares it to have been found in Athenian waters, and thence brought to Athens. An assembly was held, and it was sent to Bias. For what reason shall be explained in the life of Bias? There is yet another version that it was the work of Hephaestus presented by the god to Pelops and his marriage. Thence it passed to Menelaus and was carried off by Paris along with Helen, and was thrown by her into the Cohen Sea, for she said it would be a cause of strife. In process of time, certain people of Lebedus, having purchased a catch of fish thereabouts, obtained possession of the tripod, and quarreling with the fishermen about it, put it into Kos, and, when they would not settle the dispute, reported the fact to Miletus, their mother city. The Milesians, when their assemblies were disregarded, made war upon Kos. Many fell on both sides, and an oracle pronounced that the tripod should be given to the wisest. Both parties, to the disputed, agreed upon Thales. After it had gone the round of the sages, Thales dedicated it to Apollo of Didyma. The oracle, which the Coens received, was on this wise. 
Hephaestus cast a tripod in the sea, until it quit the city there will be. No one to strife, until it reach the seer, whose wisdom makes past, present, future clear. That of the Milesians beginning, who shall possess the tripod, has been quoted above. So much for this version of the story. Hermippus in his Lives refers to Thales the story which is told by some of Socrates, namely that he used to say that there were three blessings for which he was grateful to fortune. First, that I was born a human being and not one of the brutes. Next, that I was born a man and not a woman. Thirdly, a Greek and not a barbarian. It is said that once when he was taken out of doors by an old woman in order that he might observe the stars, he fell into a ditch, and his cry for help drew from the old woman the retort, How can you expect to know all about the heavens, Tollies, when you cannot even see what is just before your feet? Timon, too, knows him as an astronomer and praises him in the Silly, where he says, Tollies among the seven, the sage astronomer. His writings are said by Loban of Argos to have run to some two hundred lines. His statue is said to bear this inscription. Pride of Miletus and Ionian lands, wisest astronomer, here Thales stands. Of songs still sung, these verses belong to him. Many words do not declare an understanding heart. Seek one soul wisdom, choose one soul good, for thou wilt check the tongues of chatterers prating without end. Here, too, are certain current apothems assigned to him. Of all things that are, the most ancient is God, for he is uncreated. The most beautiful is the universe, for it is God's workmanship. The greatest is space, for it holds all things. The swiftest is mine, for it speeds everywhere. The strongest, necessity, for it masters all. The wisest, time, for it brings everything to light. He held there was no difference between life and death. Why then, said one, do you not die? Because, said he, there is no difference. To the question which is older, day or night, he replied, night is the older by one day. Someone asked him whether a man could hide an evil deed from the gods. No, he replied, nor yet an evil thought. To the adulterer who inquired if he should deny the charge upon oath, he replied, that perjury was no worse than adultery. Being asked of what is difficult, he replied, to know oneself. What is easy? To give advice to another. What is most pleasant? Success. What is the divine? That which has neither beginning nor end. To the question what was the strangest thing he had ever seen, his answer was, an aged tyrant. How can one best bear adversity? if he should see his enemies in worse plight. How shall we lead the best and most righteous life? By refraining from doing what we blame in others. What man is happy? He who has a healthy body, a resourceful mind, and a docile nature. He tells us to remember friends, whether present or absent, not to pride ourselves upon outward appearance, but to study to be beautiful in character. Shun ill-gotten gains, he says. Let not idle words prejudice thee against those who have shared thy confidence. Whatever provision thou hast made for thy parents, the same must thou expect from thy children. He explained the overflow of the Nile is due to the Athesian winds, which, blowing in the contrary direction, drove the waters upstream. Apollodorus in his chronology places his birth in the first year of the 35th Olympiad, he died at the age of 78, or, according to Sosocrates, of 90 years, for he died in the 58th Olympiad, being contemporary with Croesus, whom he undertook to take across the Halys without building a bridge by diverting the river. There have lived five other men who bore the name of Tales, as enumerated by Demetrius of Magnesia in his Dictionary of Men of the Same Name. 1. A rhetorician of Calatia with an affected style. 2. A painter of Sicyon, of great gifts. 3. A contemporary of Hesiod, Homer, and Lycurgus in very early times. 4. A person men by Durus in his work on painting. 5. An obscure person in more recent times who was mentioned by Dionysius in his critical writings. 
Tali's Osage died as he was watching an athletic contest from heat, thirst, and the works incident to advanced age. And the inscription on his tomb is, Here in a narrow tomb great Tali's lies, yet his renown for wisdom reached the skies. I may also cite one of my own, from my first book, Epigrams in Various Meters. As Tali's watched the games one festal day, the fierce sun smote him and he passed away. Zeus, thou didst well to raise him, his dim eyes could not from earth behold the starry skies. To him belongs the proverb, Know thyself, which Antisthenes in his Successions of Philosophers attributes to Femonoe, though admitting that it was appropriated by Chilon. This seems the proper place for a general notice of the seven sages, of whom we have such accounts as the following. Damon of Cyrene, in his History of the Philosophers, carps at all sages, but especially the seven. Anaximenes remarks that they all applied themselves to poetry. Dicciarchus that they were neither sages nor philosophers, but merely shrewd men with a turn for legislation. Architemus of Syracuse describes their meeting at the court of Kypselus, on which occasion he himself happened to be present, for which a forest substitutes a meeting without Thales at the court of Croesus. Some make the meet at the Panionian festival at Corinth and at Delphi. Their utterances are variously reported, and are attributed now to one, now to the other. For instance, the following. Chilon of Lacedaemon's words are true. Nothing too much. Good comes from measure due. Nor is there any agreement how the number is made up. For Meandrius, in place of Cleobulus and Mison, includes Leophantus, son of Gorgiadus, of Lebedus or Ephesus, and Epimenides the Cretan is on the list. Plato in his Protagoras admits my son and leaves out Periander. Ephorus substitutes Anacarsus for my son. Others add Pythagoras to the seven. Dicciarchus hands down four names fully recognized. Talus, Bias, Pittacus, and Solon. And appends the name of six others, from whom he selects three. Aristodemus, Pamphilus, Chilon the Lacedaemonian, Cleobulus, Anacarsus, Periander. Others add Acusilaus, son of Cabus, or Scabrus of Argos. Hermippus, in his work On the Sages, reckons seventeen, from which number different people make different selections of seven. They are Solon, Tales, Pittacus, Bias, Chilon, Mison, Cleobulus, Periander, Anacarsus, Acusilaus, Epimenides, Leophantus, Pherecides, Aristodemus, Pythagoras, Lassos, son of Carmontides, or Sisymbrinus, or, according to Aristoxenus of Cabernus, born at Hermione, Anaxagoras. Hippodotus, in his list of philosophers, enumerates Orpheus, Linus, Solon, Periander, Anacarsus, Cleobulus, Mison, Tales, Bias, Pittacus, Epicarmus, Pythagoras. Here follow the extant letters of Thales. Thales to Pherecides. I hear that you intend to be the first Ionian to expound theology to the Greeks, and perhaps it was a wise decision to make the book common property without taking advice, instead of entrusting it to any particular persons whatsoever, a course which has no advantages. However, if it would give you any pleasure, I am quite willing to discuss the subject of your book with you, and if you bid me come to Cyros, I will do so. For surely Solon of Athens and I would scarcely be sane if, after having sailed to Crete to pursue our inquiries there, and to Egypt to confer with the priests and astronomers, we hesitate to come to you. For Solon too will come, with your permission. You, however, are so fond of home that you seldom visit Ionia, and have no longing to see strangers. But, as I hope, apply yourself to one thing, namely, writing, while we, who never write anything, travel all over Hellas and Asia. Tallies to Solon if you leave Athens, it seems to me that you could most conveniently set up your abode at Miletus, which is an Athenian colony, for there you incur no risk. If you are vexed at the thought that we are governed by a tyrant, hating as you do all absolute rulers, you would at least enjoy the society of your friends. Bias wrote inviting you to Prini, and if you prefer the town of Prini for a residence, I myself will come and live with you. End of Tallies. Chapter 2 Solon Solon, the son of Exocestides, was born at Salamis. 
His first achievement was the Sasaktia, or Law of Release, which he introduced at Athens. Its effect was to ransom persons and property, for men used to borrow money on personal security, and many were forced from poverty to become serfs or day laborers. He then first renounced his claim to a debt of seven talents due to his father, and encouraged others to follow his example. This law of his was called Sesaktia, and the reason is obvious. He next went on to frame the rest of his laws, which would take time to enumerate and inscribe them on the revolving pillars. His greatest service was this. Megara and Athens laid rival claims to his birthplace, Salamis, and after many defeats, the Athenians passed a decree punishing with death any man who should propose a renewal of the Salaminian War. Solon, feigning madness, rushed into the Agora with a garland on his head. There he had his poem on Salamis read to the Athenians by the herald and roused them to fury. They renewed the war with the Megarians and, thanks to Solon, were victorious. These were the lines which did more than anything else to inflame the Athenians. Would I were citizen of some mean isle, far in the Sporades, for men shall smile and mock me for Athenian? Who is this, an Attic slave who gave up Salamis? And, then let us fight for Salamis and fair fame, win the beloved isle and purge our shame. He also persuaded the Athenians to acquire the Thracian Chersonese, and, lest it should be thought that he had acquired Salamis by force only and not of right, he opened certain graves and showed that the dead were buried with their faces to the east, as was the custom of burial among the Athenians. Further, that the tombs themselves faced east, and that the inscriptions graven upon them named the deceased by their deems, which is a style peculiar to Athens. Some authors assert that Homer's catalogues of the ships after the line, Ajax, twelve ships from Salamis commands. Solon inserted one of his own, and fixed their station next to Athenian bands. Thereafter the people looked up to him, and would gladly have had him rule them as tyrant. He refused, and early perceiving the designs of his kinsman Pisistratus, so we are told by Sosocrates, did his best to hinder them. He rushed into the assembly, armed with spear and shield, warned him of the designs of Pisistratus, and not only so, but declaring his willingness to render assistance in these words. Men of Athens, I am wiser than some of you and more courageous than others, wiser than those who fail to understand the plot of Pisistratus, more courageous than those who, though they see through it, keep silence through fear. And the members of the council, who were of Pisistratus' party, declared that he was mad, which made him say the lines, A little while and the event will show to all the world if I be mad or no. That he foresaw the tyranny of Pisistratus is proved by a passage from a poem of his. On splendid lightning thunder follow straight, Clouds to soft snow and flashing hailstones bring, So from proud men comes ruin and their state falls unaware to slavery and a king. When Pisistratus was already established, Solon, unable to move the people, piled his arms in front of the general's quarters and exclaimed, My country, I have served thee with my sword and word. Thereupon he sailed to Egypt and to Cyprus, and thence proceeded to the court of Croesus. There Croesus put the question, Whom do you consider happy? And Solon replied, Tell us of Athens and Cleobus, and Biton, and went on in words too familiar to be quoted here. There is a story that Croesus, in magnificent array, sat himself down on his throne and asked Solon if he had ever seen anything more beautiful. Yes, was the reply, cocks and pheasants and peacocks, for they shine in nature's colors, which are ten thousand times more beautiful. After leaving that place he lived in Calicia, and founded a city which he called Soli, after his own name. In it he settled some few Athenians who in process of time corrupted the purity of Attic and were laid to solicize. Note that the people of this town are called Solenses, the people of Soli in Cyprus, Soli. When he learned that Pisistratus was by this time tyrant, he wrote to the Athenians on this wise. If ye have suffered sadly through your own wickedness, Lay not the blame for this upon the gods, for it is you yourselves who gave pledges to your foes and made them great. This is why you bear the brand of slavery. 
Every one of you treadeth in the footsteps of the fox, yet in the mass ye have little sense. Ye look to the speech and fair words of a flatterer, paying no regard to any practical result. Thus Solon. After he had gone into exile, Pisistratus wrote to him as follows. Pisistratus to Solon. I'm not the only man who has aimed at a tyranny in Greece, nor am I, a descendant of Codrus, unfitted for the part. That is, I resume the privileges which the Athenians swore to confer upon Codrus and his family, although later they took them away. In everything else I commit no offense against God or man, but I leave to the Athenians the management of the affairs according to the ordinance established by you, and they are better governed than they would be under a democracy. For... I allow no one to extend his rights, and though I am a tyrant, I arrogate to myself no undue share of reputation and honor, but merely such stated privileges as belong to the kings in former times. Every citizen pays a tith of his property, not to me, but to a fund for defraying the cost of the public sacrifices or any other charges on the state, or the expenditure on any war which may come upon us. I don't blame you for disclosing my designs. You acted from loyalty to the city not through any enmity to me, and further, in ignorance of the sort of rule which I was going to establish. Since, if you had known, you would perhaps have tolerated me and not gone into exile. Wherefore we turn home, trusting my word, though it be not sworn, that Solon will suffer no harm from Pisistratus, for neither has any other enemy of mine suffered. Of that you may be sure. And if you choose to become one of my friends, you will rank with the foremost, for I see no trace of treachery in you, Nothing to excite mistrust, or, if you wish to live at Athens on other terms, you have my permission. But do not, on any account, sever yourself from your country. So far Pisistratus. To return to Solon, one of his sayings is that seventy years are the term of a man's life. He seems to have enacted some admirable laws. For instance, if any man neglects to provide for his parents, he shall be disenfranchised. Moreover, there is a similar penalty for the spendthrift who runs through his patrimony. Again, not to have a settled occupation is made a crime, for which any one may, if he pleases, impeach the offender. Lysias, however, in his speech against Nicias, ascribes this law to Draco, and to Solon another depriving open profligates of the right to speak in the assembly. He curtailed the honors of athletes who took part in the games, fixing the allowance for an Olympic victor at 500 drachmae for an Isthmian victor at a hundred drachmae, and proportionally in all other cases. It was in bad taste, he urged, to increase the rewards of these victors and to ignore the exclusive claims of those who had fallen in battle, whose sons ought, moreover, to be maintained and educated by the state. The effect was this that many strove to acquit themselves as gallant soldiers in battle, like Polyzolus, Cynegorus, Callimachus, and all who fought at Marathon, or again like Harmodius and Aristogiton, and Matildes, and thousands more. Athletes, on the other hand, incur heavy costs while in training, do harm when successful, and are crowned for a victory over their country rather than over their rivals. And when they grow old, they, in the words of Euripides, are worn threadbare, cloaks that have lost a nap. And Solon, perceiving this, treated them with scant respect. Excellent, too, is his provision that the guardian of an orphan should not marry the mother of his ward, and that the next heir who would succeed on the death of the orphan should be disqualified from acting as their guardian. Furthermore, that no engraver of seals should be allowed to retain an impression of the ring which he has sold, that the penalty for depriving a one-eyed man of his single eye should be the loss of the offender's two eyes. A deposit shall not be removed except by the depositor himself, on pain of death the magistrate found intoxicated should be punished with death. He has provided that the recitations of Homer shall follow in fixed order. Thus the second reciter must begin from the place where the first left off. Hence, as Ducita says in the fifth book of his Megarian history, Solon did more than Pisistratus to throw light on Homer. The passage in Homer particularly referred to is the beginning, Those who dwelt at Athens. Solon was the first to call the 30th day of the month the Old and New Day, and to institute meetings of the nine archons for private conference, as stated by Apollodorus in the second book of his works On Legislators. 
When civil strife began, he did not take sides with those in the city, nor with the plain, nor yet with the coast section. One of his sayings is, Speech is the mirror of action, and another that the strongest and most capable is king. He compared laws to spiders' webs, which stand firm when any light and yielding object falls upon them, while a larger thing breaks through them and makes off. Secrecy he called the seal of speech, and occasion the seal of secrecy. He used to say that those who had influence with tyrants were like the pebbles employed in calculations, for, as each of the pebbles represented now a large and now a small number, so the tyrants would treat one of those about them at one time as great and famous, at another as of no account. On being asked why he had not framed any laws against parricide, he replied that he hoped it was unnecessary. Asked how crime could most effectually be diminished, he replied, If it caused as much resentment in those who are not its victims as in those who are. Adding, Wealth breeds satiety, satiety, outrage. He required the Athenians to adopt a lunar month. He prohibited Thespis from performing tragedies on the ground that fiction was pernicious. When therefore Pisistratus appeared with self-inflicted wounds, Solon said, This comes from acting tragedies. His counsel to men in general is stated by Apollodorus in his work on the philosophic sects as follows. Put more trust in nobility of character than in an oath. Never tell a lie. Pursue worthy aims. Do not be rash to make friends, and, when once they are made, do not drop them. Learn to obey before you command. In giving advice, seek to help, not please, your friend. Be led by reason, shun evil company, honor the gods, reverence parents. He is also said to have criticized the couplet of Mimernus. Would that by no disease, no care oppressed, I, in my sixtieth year, were laid to rest. And to have replied thus, Oh, take a friend's suggestion, blot the line, Grudge not if my invention better thine, Surely a wiser wish were thus expressed, At eighty years, let me be laid to rest. Of the songs sung, this is attributed to Solon. Watch every man and see whether, Hiding hatred in his heart, He speaks with friendly countenance, and his tongue rings with double speech from a dark soul. He is undoubtedly the author of the laws which bear his name, of speeches and of poems in elegiac meter, namely counsels addressed to himself on Solomus and on the Athenian constitution, 5,000 lines in all, not to mention poems in iambic meter and epods. His statue had the following inscription. At Solomus, which crushed the Persian might, Solon the legislator, first saw light. He flourished, according to Sosocrates, about the 46th Olympiad, and in the third year of which he was archon at Athens. It was then that he enacted his laws. He died in Cyprus at the age of 80. His last injunctions to his relations were on this wise, that they should convey his bones to Solomus, and when they had been reduced to ashes, scatter them over the soil. Hence, Cratinus in his play, The Chirons, makes him say, this is my island home, my dust, men say, is scattered far and wide over Ajax's land. An epigram of my own is also contained in the collection of epigrams in various meters mentioned above, where I have discoursed of all illustrious dead in all meters and rhythms, in epigrams and lyrics. Here it is. Far Cyprian fire his body burnt, his bones turned to dust, made grain at Solomus. Wheel-like, his pillars bore his soul on high, so light the burden of his laws on men. It is said that he was the author of the apothem, Nothing Too Much, Ne Quid Nimis, according to Dioscurides in his memorabilia. When he was weeping for the loss of his son, of whom nothing more is known, and someone said to him, It is all of no avail. He replied, That is why I weep, because it is of no avail. The following letters are attributed to Solon. Solon to Periander You tell me that many are plotting against you. You must lose no time if you want to get rid of them all. A conspirator against you might arise from quite an unexpected quarter. Say, 
one who had fears for his personal safety, or one who disliked your timorous dread of anything and everything, he would earn the gratitude of the city who found out that you had no suspicion. The best course would be to resign power and so be quit of the reproach. But if you must, at all hazards, remain tyrant, endeavor to make your mercenary force stronger than the forces of the city. Then you have no one to fear, and need not banish anyone. So on to Epimenides. It seems that after all I was not to confer much benefit on Athenians by my laws, any more than you by purifying the city. For religion and legislation are not sufficient in themselves to benefit cities. It can only be done by those who lead the multitude in any direction they choose. And so, if things are going well, religion and legislation are beneficial. If not, they are of no avail. Nor are my laws all my enactments either. But the popular leaders did the commonwealth harm by permitting license, and could not hinder Pisistratus from setting up a tyranny. And when I warned them, they would not believe me. He found more credit when he flattered people than I when I told him the truth. I laid my arms down before the general's quarters and told the people that I was wiser than those who did not see that Pisistratus was aiming at tyranny, and more courageous than those who shrank from resisting him. They, however, denounced Solon as mad, and at last I protested, My country, I, Solon, am ready to defend thee by word and deed, but some of my countrymen think me mad. Wherefore I will go forth out of their midst as the sole opponent of Pisistratus, and let them, if they like, become his bodyguard. For you must know, my friend, that he was beyond measure ambitious to be tyrant. He began by being a popular leader. His next step was to inflict wounds on himself and appear before the court of the Helea, crying out that these wounds had been inflicted by his enemies, and he requested them to give him a guard of four hundred young men. And the people, without listening to me, granted him the men, who were armed with clubs. And after, that he destroyed the democracy. It was in vain that I sought to free the poor amongst the Athenians from their condition of serfdom, if now they are all slaves of one master, Pisistratus. Solon to Pisistratus. I am sure that I shall suffer no harm at your hands, for before you became a tyrant, I was your friend. And now I have no quarrel with you beyond that of every Athenian who disapproves of tyranny. Whether it is better for them to be ruled by one man or to live under a democracy, each of us must decide for himself upon his own judgment. You are, I admit, of all tyrants the best, but I see that it is not well for me to return to Athens. I gave the Athenians equality of civil rights. I refused to become tyrant when I had the opportunity. How then? Could I escape censure if I were now to return and set my approval on all that you are doing? So on to Croesus. I admire you for your kindness to me, and by Athena, if I had not been anxious before all things to live in a democracy, I would rather have fixed my abode in your palace than at Athens, where Pisistratus is setting up a rule of violence. But in truth, to live in a place where all have equal rights is more to my liking. However, I will come and see you for I am eager to make your acquaintance. End of Solon Chapter 3 Chilon Chilon, son of Demagedus, was a Lacedaemonian. He wrote a poem in elegiac meter, some two hundred lines in length, and he declared that the excellence of a man is to divine the future so far as it could be grasped by reason. When his brother grumbled that he was not made ephor as Chilon was, the latter replied, I know how to submit to injustice, and you do not. He was made ephor in the 55th Olympiad. Pamphila, however, says the 56th. He first became ephor, according to Sosocrates, in the archonship of Euthydemus. He first proposed the appointment of ephors as auxiliaries to the kings, though Satyrus says this was done by Lysurgus. As Herodotus relates in his first book, when Hippocrates was sacrificing at Olympia and his cauldrons boiled of their own accord, it was Chilon who advised him not to marry, or, if he had a wife, to divorce her and to stone his children. The tale is also told that he inquired of Aesop what Zeus was doing and received the answer. He is humbling the proud and exalting the humble. Being asked wherein lies the difference between the educated and the uneducated, Chilon answered, in good hope. What is hard? 
to keep a secret, to employ leisure well, to be able to bear an injury. These again are some of his precepts, to control the tongue, especially at a banquet, not to abuse our neighbors, for if you do, things will be said about you which you will regret. Do not use threats to anyone, for that is womanish. Be more ready to visit friends in adversity than in prosperity. Do not make an extravagant marriage. De mortuis nil nisi bonum. Honor old age. Consult your own safety. Prefer a loss to a dishonest gain. The one brings pain at the moment, the other for all time. Do not laugh at another's misfortune. When strong, be merciful, if you would have the respect, not the fear, of your neighbors. Learn to be a wise master in your own house. Let not your tongue outrun your thought. Control anger. Do not hate divination. Do not aim at impossibilities. Let no one see you in a hurry. Gesticulation and speaking should be avoided as a mark of insanity. Obey the laws. Be restful. Of his songs, the most popular is the following. By the whetstone gold is tried, giving manifest proof, and by gold is the mind of good and evil men brought to the test. He is reported to have said in his old age that he was not aware of having ever broken the law throughout his life. But one point he was not quite clear. In a suit in which a friend of his was concerned, he himself pronounced sentence according to the law, but he persuaded his colleague, who was his friend, to acquit the accused in order at once to maintain the law, and yet not to lose his friend. He became very famous in Greece by his warning about the island of Cythera off the Laconian coast, for, becoming acquainted with the nature of the island, he exclaimed, Would it had never been placed there, or else had been sunk in the depths of the sea. And this was a wise warning, for Demaratus, when exiled from Sparta, advised Xerxes to anchor his fleet off the island, and if Xerxes had taken the advice, Greece would have been conquered. Later, in the Peloponnesian War, Nicias reduced the island and placed an Athenian garrison there, and did the Lacedaemonians much mischief. He was a man of a few words, hence Aristagoras of Miletus calls this style of speaking Colonian, is of Brancus, founder of the temple at Brancidae. Chilon was an old man about the 52nd Olympiad, when Aesop, the fabulist, was flourishing. According to Hermippus, his death took place at Pisa, just after he had congratulated his son on an Olympic victory at boxing. It was due to excess of joy coupled with the weakness of a man stricken in years, and all present joined in the funeral procession. I have written an epitaph on him also, which runs as follows. I praise thee, Pollux, for that Chilon's son... By boxing feats the olive chaplet won. Nor at the father's fate should we repine. He died of joy. May such a death be mine. The inscription on his statue runs thus. Here Chilon stands of Sparta's warrior race, Who of the sages seven holds highest place. His apothem is, Give a pledge and suffer for it. A short letter is also ascribed to him, Chilon to Periander. You tell me of an expedition against foreign enemies, in which you yourself will take the field. In my opinion, affairs at home are not too safe for an absolute ruler, and I esteem the tyrant happy who dies a natural death in his own house. End of Chilon. Chapter 4. Pittacus. Pittacus was the son of Herhadius and a native of Mytilene. Durus calls his father a Thracian. Aided by the brothers of Alcaeus, he overthrew Melancris, tyrant of Lesbos. And in the war between Mytilene and Athens for the territory of Achilles, he himself had the chief command on the one side, and Phrynon, who had won an Olympic victory in the Pancratium, commanded the Athenians. Pittacus agreed to meet him in single combat. With a net which he concealed beneath his shield, he entangled Phrynon, killed him, and recovered the territory. Subsequently, as Apollodorus states in his chronology, Athens and Mytilene referred their claims to arbitration. Periander heard the appeal and gave judgment in favor of Athens. At the time, however, the people of Mytilene honored Pittacus extravagantly and entrusted him with the government. He ruled for ten years and brought the constitution into order, and then laid down his office. He lived another ten years after his abdication and received from the people of Mytilene a grant of land, which he dedicated as sacred domain 
and it bears his name to this day. Sosocrates relates that he cut off a small portion for himself and pronounced the half to be more than the whole. Furthermore, he declined an offer of money made him by Croesus, saying that he had twice as much as he wanted, for his brother had died without issue and he had inherited his estate. Pamphila, in the second book of her Memorabilia, narrates that, As his son Tereus sat in a barber's shop in Syme, a smith killed him with a blow from an axe. When the people of Syme sent the murderer to Pittacus, he, on learning the story, set him at liberty and declared that, It is better to pardon now than to repent later. Heraclitus, however, says that it was Alcaeus whom he set at liberty when he had gotten him in his power, and that what he said was, Mercy is better than vengeance. Among the laws which he made is one providing that for any offense committed in a state of intoxication, the penalty should be doubled. His object was to discourage drunkenness, wine being abundant on the island. One of his sayings is, It is hard to be good, which is cited by Simonides in this form. Pittacus's maxim, truly to become a virtuous man, is hard. Plato also cites him in the Protagoras, even the gods do not fight against necessity. Again, office shows the man. Once, when asked what is the best rule, he replied, to do well the work in hand. And when Croesus inquired what is the best rule, he answered, the rule of the shifting wood, by which he meant the law. He also urged men to win bloodless victories. When the Phocaeans said that we must search for a good man, Pittacus rejoined, If you seek too carefully, you will never find him. He answered various inquiries. Thus, what is agreeable? Time. Obscure. The future. Trustworthy. The earth. Untrustworthy. The sea. It is the part of prudent men, he said, before difficulties arise, to provide against their rising and of courageous men to deal with them when they have risen. Do not announce your plans beforehand, for if they fail, you will be laughed at. Never reproach any one with a misfortune, for fear of nemesis. Duly restore what has been entrusted to you. Speak no ill of a friend, nor even of an enemy. Practice piety, love temperance, cherish truth, fidelity, skill, cleverness, sociability, carefulness. Of his songs, the most popular is this. With bow and well-stored quiver, we must march against our foe. Words of his tongue can no man trust, for in his heart there is a deceitful thought. He also wrote poems in elegiac meter, some 600 lines, and a prose work on laws for the use of the citizens. He was flourishing about the 42nd Olympiad, he died in the archonship of Aristomenes in the third year of the 52nd Olympiad, having lived more than 70 years to a good old age. The inscription on his monument runs thus. Here, holy Lesbos, with a mother's woe, bewails her Pittacus, whom death laid low. To him belongs the apothem, Know thine opportunity. There was another Pittacus, a legislator, as is stated by Favorinus in the first book of his memorabilia, and by Demetrius in his work on men of the same name. He was called the Less. To return to the stage, the story goes that a young man took counsel with him about marriage, and received this answer, as given by Callimachus in his epigrams. A stranger of Aternaeus thus inquired of Pittacus, the son of Herhatus, Old sire, two offers of marriage are made to me. The one bride is in wealth, and birth my equal. The other is my superior. Which is the better? Come now and advise me which of the two I shall wed. So spake he. But Pittacus, raising his staff and old man's weapon, said, See there, yonder boys will tell you the whole tale. The boys were whipping their tops to make them go fast and spinning them in a wide open space. Follow in their track, said he. So he approached near and the boys were saying, Keep to your own sphere. When he heard this, the stranger desisted from aiming at the lordlier match, assenting to the warning of the boys. And even as he led home the humble bride, so you, Dion, keep to your own sphere. The advice seems to have been prompted by his situation, for he had married a wife superior in birth to himself, 
She was a sister of Draco, the son of Pentelus, and she treated him with great haughtiness. Alcaeus nicknamed him Sarapus and Sarapos, because he had flat feet and dragged them in walking. Also Chilblames, because he had chapped feet, for which their word was Geras, and Braggadocio, because he was always swaggering. A diner in the dark, because he dispensed with a lamp, and the Sloven, because he was untidy and dirty. The exercise he took was grinding corn, as related by Clearchus, the philosopher. The following short letter is ascribed to him. Letter of Pittacus to Croesus. You bid me come to Lydia in order to see your prosperity, but without seeing it I can well believe that the son of Alyattes is the most opulent of kings. There will be no advantage to me in a journey to Sardis, for I am not in want of money, and my possessions are sufficient for my friends as well as myself. Nevertheless, I will come to be entertained by you and to make your acquaintance. End of Pittacus Chapter 4 Bias Bias, the son of Totumes, was born at Preen, and by Satyrus is placed at the head of the seven sages. Some make him of a wealthy family, but Durus says he was a laborer living in the house. Phenoticus relates that he ransomed certain Messenian maidens captured in war and brought them up as his daughters, gave them dowries, and restored them to their fathers in Messenia. In course of time, as has been related, the bronze tripod with the inscription, To him that is wise, having been found at Athens by the fishermen, the maidens, according to Satyrus, or their father, according to other accounts, including that of Phenoticus, came forward into the assembly and, after the recital of their own adventures, pronounced Bias to be wise, and thereupon the tripod was dispatched to him. But Bias, on seeing it, declared that Apollo was wise and refused to take the tripod. But others say that he dedicated it to Heracles and Thebes, since he was a descendant of the Thebans who had found a colony at Preen, and this is the version of Phenoticus. The story is told that while Oyates was besieging Preen, Bias fattened two mules and drove them into the camp, and that the king, when he saw them, was amazed at the good condition of the citizens actually extending to their beasts of burden, and he decided to make terms and sent a messenger. But Bias piled up heaps of sand with a layer of corn on top and showed them to the man, and finally, on being informed of this, Oyates made a peace treaty with the people of Preen. Soon afterwards, when Ayates sent to invite Bias to his court, he replied, Tell Ayates from me to make his diet of onions, that to weep. It is also stated that he was a very effective pleader, but he was accustomed to use his powers of speech to a good end. Hence it is said to this that Demodocus of Lerus makes reference in the line, If you happen to be prosecuting a suit, plead as they do at Preen. And Hipponax thus more powerful in pleading causes than bias of preen. This was the manner of his death. He had been pleading in defense of some client in spite of his great age. When he had finished speaking, he reclined his head on his grandson's bosom. The opposing counsel made a speech. The judges voted and gave their verdict in favor of the client of bias, who, when the court rose, was found dead in his grandson's arms. The city gave him a magnificent funeral and inscribed on his tomb, here Bias of Preen lies, whose name brought to his home in all Ionia fame. My own epitaph is, Here Bias rests, a quiet death laid low, The aged head which years had strewn with snow, His pleading done, his friend preserved from harm, A long sleep took him in his grandson's arms. He wrote a poem of two thousand lines on Ionia, In the manner of rendering it prosperous, of his songs, the most popular is the following. Find favor with all the citizens, in whatever state you dwell, for this earns most gratitude. The headstrong spirit often flashes forth with harmful pain. The growth of strength in man is nature's work, but to set forth in speech the interests of one's country is the gift of soul and reason. Even chance brings abundance wealth to many, he also said that he who could not bear misfortune was truly unfortunate, that it is a disease of the soul to be enamored of things impossible of attainment, and that we ought not to dwell upon the woes of others. Being asked what is difficult, he replied, nobly to endure a change for the worse. 
He was once on a voyage with some impious men, and when a storm was encountered, even they began to call upon the gods for help. Peace, said he, lest they hear and become aware that you are here on the ship. When an impious man asked him to define piety, he was silent. And when the other inquired the reason, I am silent, he replied, because you are asking questions about what does not concern you. Being asked, what is sweet to men? He answered, hope. He said he would rather decide a dispute between two of his enemies than between two of his friends, for in the latter case he would be certain to make one of his friends his enemy, but in the former case he would make one of his enemies his friends. Asked what occupation gives a man most pleasure, he replied, making money. He advised men to measure life as if they had both a short and a long time to live, to love their friends as if they would some day hate them, the majority of mankind being bad. Further, he gave this advice. Be slow to set about an enterprise, but persevere in it steadfastly when once it is undertaken. Do not be hasty of speech, for that is a sign of madness. Cherish wisdom. Admit the existence of the gods. If a man is unworthy, do not praise him because of his wealth. Gain your reputation by persuasion, not by force. Ascribe your good actions to the gods. Make wisdom your provision for the journey from youth to old age, for it is more certain support than all other possessions. Bias is mentioned by Hipponax, as stated above, and Heraclitus, who was hard to please, bestows upon him a special praise in these words. In Preen lived Bias, son of Totamis, a man more consideration than any, and the people of Preen dedicated a precinct to him, which is called the Totamium. His apothem is... Most men are bad. End of Bias Chapter 5 Cleobulus Cleobulus, the son of Eugorus, was born at Lindus, but according to Durus, he was a Carian. Some say that he traces his descent back to Heracles, that he was distinguished for strength and beauty, and was acquainted with Egyptian philosophy. He had a daughter, Cleobuline, who composed riddles and hexameters. She is mentioned by Cratinus, who gives one of his plays her name, in the plural form of Cleobulini. He is also said to have built a temple of Athena, which was founded by the Nous. He was the author of songs and riddles, making some 3,000 lines in all. The inscription on the tomb of Midas is said by some to be his. I am a maiden of bronze, and I rest upon Midas's tomb. So long as water shall flow, and tall trees grow, and the sun shall rise and shine, and the bright moon, and rivers shall run, and the sea wash the shore, here abiding on his tear-sprinkled tomb, I shall tell the passers-by, Midas is buried here. The evidence they adduce is a poem by Simonides, in which he says, Who, if he trusts his wits, will praise Cleobulus, the dweller at Lindus, for opposing the strength of a column to ever-flowing rivers, the flowers of spring, the flame of the sun, and the golden moon, and the eddies of the sea? But all things fall short of the might of the gods, even mortal hands break marble in pieces. This is a fool's devising. The inscription cannot be by Homer, because he lived, as they say, long before Midas, the following riddle of Cleobulus is preserved in Pamphila's collection. One sire there is, he has twelve sons, and each of these has twice thirty daughters, different in feature. Some of the daughters are white, the others again are black. They are immortal, and yet they all die. The answer is, the year. Of his songs, the most popular are, it is want of taste that reigns most widely among mortals in multitude of words. But due season will serve. Set your mind on something good. Do not become thoughtless or rude. He said that we ought to give our daughters to their husbands, maidens in years, but women in wisdom, thus signifying that girls need to be educated as well as boys. Further, that we should render a service to a friend to bind him close to us, and to an enemy in order to make a friend of him. For we have to guard against the censure of friends and the intrigues of enemies. When anyone leaves his house, let him first inquire what he means to do, and on his return let him ask, what has he effected? Moreover, he advised men to practice bodily exercise, to be listeners rather than talkers, to choose instruction rather than ignorance, 
to refrain from ill-omened words, to be friendly to virtue, hostile to vice, to shun injustice, to counsel the state for the best, not to be overcome by pleasure, to do nothing by violence, to educate their children, to put an end to enmity. Avoid being affectionate to your wife or quarreling with her in the presence of strangers, for the one savors of folly, the other of madness. Never correct a servant over your wine, for you will be thought to be the worse for the wine. Mate with one of your own rank, for if you take a wife who is superior to you, her kinsfolk will become your masters. When men are being bantered, do not laugh at their expense, or you will incur their hatred. Do not be arrogant in prosperity. If you fall into poverty, do not humble yourself. Know how to bear the changes of fortune with nobility. He died at the ripe age of seventy, and the inscription over him is, Here the wise Rhodian Cleobulus sleeps, and over his ashes see proud Lindus weeps. His apothem was, Moderation is best, and he wrote to Solon the following letter. Cleobulus to Solon. You have many friends, and a home wherever you go, but the most suitable for Solon will, say I, be Lindus, which is governed by a democracy. The island lies on the high seas, and one who lives here has nothing to fear from Pisistratus, and friends from all parts will come to visit you. End of Cleobulus Chapter 6 Periander Periander, the son of Kypselus, was born at Corinth, of the family of the Heraclidae. His wife was Lysida, whom he called Melissa. Her father was Procles, tyrant of Epidaurus, her mother Aristonea, daughter of Aristocrates and sister of Aristodemus, who together reigned over nearly the whole of Arcadia, as stated by Heraclides of Pontus in his book On Government. By her he had two sons, Kypselus and Lycophron. The younger, a man of intelligence, the elder, weak in mind. However, after some time, in a fit of anger, he killed his wife by throwing a footstool at her, or by a kick, when she was pregnant, having been egged on by the slanderous tales of concubines, whom he afterwards burnt alive. When the son, whose name was Lycophron, grieved for his mother, he banished him to Corsaira, and when, well advanced in years, he sent for his son to be his successor in the tyranny, but the Corsarians put him to death before he could set sail. Enrolled at this, he dispatched the sons of the Corsarians to Oyates, that he might make eunuchs of them. But when the ship touched at Samos, they took sanctuary in the temple of Hera and were saved by the Samians. Periander lost heart and died at the age of eighty. So Socrates' account is that he died forty-one years before Croesus, just before the forty-ninth Olympiad. Herodotus, in his first book, says that he was a guest friend of Thrasybulus, tyrant of Miletus. Aristippus, in the first book of his work, On the Luxury of the Ancients, accuses him of incest with his own mother, Critea, and adds that, when the fact came to light, he vented his annoyance in indiscriminate severity. Ephorus records his vow that, if he won the victory at Olympia in the chariot race, he would set up a golden statue. When the victory was won, being in sore straits for gold, he despoiled the women of all the ornaments which he had seen them wearing at some local festival. He was thus enabled to send the votive offering. There is a story that he did not wish the place where he was buried to be known, and to that end contrived the following device. He ordered two young men to go out at night by a certain road which he pointed out to them. They were to kill the man they met and bury him. He afterwards ordered four more to go in pursuit of the two, kill them, and bury them. Again, he dispatched a large number in pursuit of the four. Having taken these measures, he himself encountered the first pair and was slain. The Corinthians placed the following inscription upon a kenotaph. In Mother Earth here Periander lies, the prince of sea-girth Corinth, rich and wise. My own epitaph on him is, Grieve not because thou hast not gained thine end, but take with gladness all the gods may send, be warned by Periander's fate, who died, of grief that one desire should be denied. To him belongs the maxim, never do anything for money. Leave gain to trades pursued for gain. He wrote a didactic poem of two thousand lines. He said that those tyrants who intend to be safe should make loyalty their bodyguard, not arms. When someone asked him why he was a tyrant, he replied, 
because it is as dangerous to retire voluntarily as to be dispossessed. Here are other sayings of his. Rest is beautiful. Rashness has its perils. Gain is ignoble. Democracy is better than tyranny. Pleasures are transient. Honors are immortal. Be moderate in prosperity, prudent in adversity. Be the same to your friends whether they are in prosperity or in adversity. Whatever agreement you make, stick to it. Betray no secret. Correct not only the offenders, but also those who are on the point of offending. He was the first who had a bodyguard and who changed his government into a tyranny. And he will let no one live in the town without his permission, as we know from Ephorus and Aristotle. He flourished about the 39th Olympiad and was tyrant for 40 years. Sotion and Heraclides and Pamphila in the fifth book of her commentaries distinguished two perianders, one a tyrant, the other a sage who was born in Ambracia. Neantes of Cyzicus also says this, and adds that they were near relations, and Aristotle maintains that the Corinthian periander was the sage, while Plato denies this. His apothem is, practice makes perfect. He planned a canal across the isthmus. A letter of his is extant. Periander to the wise men. Very grateful am I to Pythian Apollo that I found you gathered together, and my letters will also bring you to Corinth, where, as you know, I will give you a thoroughly popular reception. I learned that last year you met in Sardis at the Lydian court. Do not hesitate, therefore, to come to me, the ruler of Corinth. The Corinthians will be pleased to see you coming to the house of Periander. Periander to Procles The murder of my wife was unintentional, but yours is deliberate guilt when you set my son's heart against me. Either therefore put an end to my son's harsh treatment, or I will revenge myself on you. For long ago I made expiation to you for your daughter by burning on her pyre the apparel of all the women of Corinth. There is also a letter written to him by Thrasybulus as follows. Thrasybulus to Periander I made no answer to your herald, but I took him into a cornfield, and with a staff smote and cut off the overgrown ears of corn, while he accompanied me. And if you ask him what he heard and what he saw, he will give his message. And this is what you must do if you want to strengthen your absolute rule. Put to death those among the citizens who are preeminent, whether they are hostile to you or not. For, to an absolute ruler, even a friend is an object of suspicion. End of Periander Chapter 7 Anacharsis Anacharsis the Scythian was the son of Nurus and brother of Cadudius, king of Scythia. His mother was a Greek, and for this reason he spoke both languages. He wrote on the institutions of the Greeks and the Scythians, dealing with simplicity of life and military matters, a poem of 800 lines. So outspoken was he that he furnished occasion for a proverb, to talk like a Scythian. So Socrates makes him come to Athens about the 47th Olympiad in the archonship of Eucrates. Hermippus relates that on his arrival at the house of Solon, he told one of the servants to announce that Anacharsis had come, and was desirous of seeing him, and if possible, of becoming his guest. The servant delivered his message and was ordered by Solon to tell him that men, as a rule, choose their guests from among their own countrymen. Then Anacharsis took him up and said that he was now in his own country, and had a right to be entertained as a guest. And Solon, struck with his ready wit, admitted him to his house and made him his greatest friend. After a while, Anacharsis returned to Scythia, where, owing to his enthusiasm for everything Greek, he was supposed to be subverting the national institutions, and was killed by his brother while they were hunting together. When struck by the arrow, he exclaimed, My reputation carried me safe throughout Greece, but the envy it excited at home has been my ruin. In some accounts, it is said that he was slain while performing Greek rites. Here is my epitaph upon him. Back from his travels, Anacharsis came to Hellenize the Scythians all aglow. Ere half his sermon could their minds inflame, a winged arrow laid the preacher low. It was a saying of his that the vine borne three kinds of grapes, the first of pleasure, the next of intoxication, and the third of disgust. He said he wondered why in Greece experts contest in the game and non-experts award the prizes. Being asked how one could avoid becoming a toper, he answered, 
by keeping before your eyes the disgraceful exhibition made by the drunkard. Again, he expressed surprise that the Greek lawgivers should impose penalties on wanton outrage while they honored athletes for bruising one another. After ascertaining that the ship's side was four fingers' breadth in thickness, he remarked that the passengers were just so far from death. Oil he called a drug which produced madness because the athletes, when they anoint themselves with it, are maddened against each other. How is it, he asked, that the Greeks prohibit falsehood and yet obviously tell falsehoods in retail trade? Nor could he understand why at the beginning of their feast they drink from small goblets and when they are full from large ones. The inscription on his statue is Bridal Speech, Gluttony, and Sensuality. Being asked if there were flutes in Scythia, he replied, No, nor yet vines. To the question what vessels were the safest, his reply was, Those which had been hauled ashore. And he declared the strangest thing he had seen in Greece to be that they leave the smoke on the mountains and convey the fuel into the city. When someone inquired which were more in number, the living or the dead, he rejoined, In which category, then, do you place those who are on the seas? When some Athenian reproached him with being a Scythian, he replied, Well, granted that my country is a disgrace to me, you are a disgrace to your country. To the question, What among men is both good and bad? His answer was, The tongue. He said it was better to have one friend of great worth than many friends worth nothing at all. He defined the market as a place set apart where men may deceive and overreach one another. When insulted by a boy over the wine, he said, If you cannot carry your liquor when you are young, boy, you will be a water carrier when you are old. According to some, he was the inventor of the anchor and the potter's wheel. To him is attributed the following letter. Anacarsis to Croesus. I have come, O king of the Lydians, to the land of the Greeks to be instructed in their manners and pursuits. And I am not even in quest of gold, but am well content to return to Scythia a better man. At all events, here I am in Sardis, being greatly desirous of making your acquaintance. End of Anacarsis Chapter 8 Mycen. Mycen was the son of Strymon, according to Sosocrates, who quotes Hermippus as his authority, and a native of Chen, a village in the district of Oeta, or Laconia, and he is reckoned one of the seven sages. They say that his father was a tyrant. We are told by someone that when Anacharsis inquired if there were anyone wiser than himself, the Pythian priestess gave the response which had already been quoted in the life of Thales, as a reply to a question by Chilon. My son of Chen in Oeta, this is he who, for wise-heartedness, surpasseth thee. His curiosity aroused, Anacarsis went to the village in summertime and found him fitting a share to a plough, and said, My son, this is not the season for the plough. It is just the time to repair it, was the reply. Others cite the first line of the oracle differently. My son of Chen and Etis, and inquire what my son of Etis means. Parmenides indeed explains that Etis is a district in Laconia to which my son belonged. So Socrates, in his Successions of Philosophers, makes him belong to Etis on the father's side and to Chen on the mother's. Eutyphro, the son of Heraclides of Pontus, declares that he was a Cretan, Etea being a town in Crete. Anaxilaus makes him an Arcadian. My son is mentioned by Hipponax, the words being and Mycen, whom Apollo self-proclaimed wisest of all men. Aristoxenus, in his historical gleaning, says he was not unlike Timon and Apamantus, for he was a misanthrope. At any rate, he was seen in Lacedaemon laughing to himself in a lonely spot, and when someone suddenly appeared and asked him why he laughed when no one was near, he replied, That is just the reason. And Aristoxenus says that the reason why he remained obscure was that he belonged to no city but to a village, and that an unimportant one. Hence, because he was unknown, some writers, but not Plato the philosopher, attributed to Pisistratus the tyrant, would properly belong to Mycen, for Plato mentions him in the Protagoras, reckoning him as one of the seven instead of Periander. He used to say we should not investigate facts by the light of arguments, but arguments by the light of facts, for the facts were not put together to fit the arguments, but the arguments to fit the facts. 
He died at the age of 97. End of Mycin. Chapter 9. Epimenides. Epimenides, according to Theompopus and many other writers, was the son of Festius. Some, however, make him the son of Dociadus, others of Aegisarchus. He was a native of Knossos in Crete, though from wearing his hair long, he did not look like a Cretan. One day, he was sent into the country by his father to look for a stray sheep, and at noon he turned out of the way and went to sleep in a cave, where he slept for fifty-seven years. After this he got up and went in search of the sheep, thinking he had been asleep for a short time. And when he could not find it, he came to the farm and found everything had changed, and another owner in possession. Then he went back into the town in utter perplexity, and there, on entering his own home, he fell in with the people who wanted to know who he was. At length he found his younger brother, now an old man, and learned the truth from him. So he became famous throughout Greece, and was believed to be a special favorite of heaven. Hence, when the Athenians were attacked by pestilence, and the Pythian priestess bade them purify the city, they sent a ship commanded by Nikia, son of Nicaratus, to Crete, to ask the help of Epimenides. And he came into the 46th Olympiad, purified their city, and stopped the pestilence in the following way. He took sheep, some black and others white, and brought them to the Areopagus, and there he let them go whither they pleased, instructing those who followed them to mark the spot where each sheep lay down and offer a sacrifice to the local divinity. And thus it is said the plague was stayed. Hence, even to this day, altars may be found in different parts of Athens with no name inscribed upon them, which are memorials of this atonement. According to some writers, he declared the plague to have been caused by the pollution which Chilon brought on the city, and showed them how to remove it. In consequence, two young men, Cratinus and Tasibius, were put to death, and the city was delivered from the scourge. The Athenians voted him a talent in money and a ship to convey him back to Crete. The money he declined, but he concluded a treaty of friendship and alliance between Nosos and Athens. So he returned home and soon afterwards died. According to Phlegon in his work On Longevity, he lived 157 years. According to the Cretans, 299 years. Xenophanes of Colophon gives his age as 154, according to hearsay. He wrote a poem on the birth of the Curetes and Corybantes, and a theogony, 5,000 lines in all. Another on the building of the Argo and Jason's voyage to Colchis in 6,500 lines. He also compiled prose works on sacrifices and the Cretan constitution, also on Minos and Redamantus, running to about 4,000 lines. At Athens again, he founded the Temple of the Eumenides, as Lobon of Argos tells us in his work On Poets. He is stated to have been the first who purified houses and fields, and the first who founded temples. Some are found to maintain that he did not go to sleep, but withdrew himself for a while, engaged in gathering simples. There is an extant letter of his to Solon the lawgiver, containing a scheme of government which Minos drew up for the Cretans. But Demetrius of Magnesia, in his work on poets and writers of the same name, endeavors to discredit the letter on the ground that it is late, and not written in the Cretan dialect, but in Attic, and New Attic too. However, I have found another letter by him which runs as follows. Epimenides to Solon Courage, my friend, for if Pisistratus had attacked the Athenians while they were still serfs and before they had good laws, he would have secured power in perpetuity by the enslavement of the citizens. But as it is, he is reducing to subjection men who are no cowards, men who with pain and shame remember Solon's warning and will never endure to be under a tyrant. But even should Pisistratus himself hold down the city, I do not expect that his power will be continued to his children, for it is hard to contrive that men brought up as free men under the best of laws should be slaves. But, instead of going on your travels, come quietly to Crete to me, for here you will have no monarch to fear, whereas if some of his friends should fall in with you while you are traveling about, I fear you may come to some harm. This is the tenor of the letter. But Demetrius reports a story that he received from the nymphs food of a special sort and kept it in a cow's hoof that he took small doses of this food, which was entirely absorbed into his system, and he was never seen to eat. Timaeus mentions him in his second book. Some writers say that the Cretans sacrificed to him as a god, for they say that he had superhuman foresight. For instance, when he saw Munikia at Athens, he said the Athenians did not know how many evils that place would bring upon them, for if they did, they would destroy it even if they had to do so with their teeth. And this he said so long before the event. 
It is also stated that he was the first to call himself Aeacus, that he foretold to the Lacedaemonians their defeat by the Arcadians, and that he claimed that his soul had passed through many incarnations. Theompopus relates in his Mirabilia that, as he was building a temple to the nymphs, a voice came from heaven, Epimenides, not a temple to the nymphs but to Zeus, and that he foretold to the Cretans the defeat of the Lacedaemonians by the Arcadians, as already stated. And, in very truth, they were crushed at Orchomenus. And he became old in as many days as he had slept years, for this too is stated by Theompopus. Myronianus, in his Parallels, declares that the Cretans called him one of the Curetes. The Lacedaemonians guard his body in their own keeping in obedience to an oracle. This is stated by Sosibius the Laconian. There have been two other men named Epimenides, namely the genealogist and another who wrote in Doric Greek about rods. End of Epimenides Chapter 10 Pherecides Pherecides, a son of Bobbis and a native of Cyros, according to Alexander in his Successions of Philosophers, was a pupil of Pittacus. Theompopus tells us that he was the first who wrote in Greek on nature and the gods. Many wonderful stories are told about him. He was walking along the beach in Samos and saw a ship running before the wind. He exclaimed that in no long time she would go down. And, even as he watched her, down she went. And as he was drinking water, which had been drawn up from a well, he predicted that on the third day there would be an earthquake, which came to pass. And on his way from Olympia, he advised Perilaus, his host in Messene, to move thence with all belonging to him. But Perilaus would not be persuaded, and Messene was afterwards taken. He bade the Lacedaemonians set no store by gold or silver, as Theopopus relates in his Mirabilia. He told them he had received this command from Heracles in a dream, and the same night Heracles enjoined upon the kings to obey Pherecides. But some fastened this story upon Pythagoras. Hermippus relates that on the eve of war between Ephesus and Magnesia, he favored the cause of the Ephesians, and inquired of someone passing by where he came from, and on receiving the reply from Ephesus, he said, Drag me by the legs and place me in the territory of Magnesia, and take a message to your countrymen, that after their victory they must bury me there, and that this is the last injunction of Pherecides. The man gave the message. A day later, the Ephesians attacked and defeated the Magnesians. They found Pherecides dead and buried him on the spot with great honors. Another version is that he came to Delphi and hurled himself down from Mount Coricus. But Aristoxenus, in his work on Pythagoras and his school, affirms that he died a natural death and was buried by Pythagoras in Delos. Another account again is that he died of a verminous disease. That Pythagoras was also present and inquired how he was and he thrust his finger through the doorway and exclaimed, My skin tells its own tale, a phrase subsequently applied by the grammarians as equivalent to getting worse, although some wrongly understand it to mean all is going well. He maintained that the divine name for table is Diodos, or that which takes care of offerings. Andron of Ephesus says that there were two natives of Cyros who bore the name of Pherecides, the one was an astronomer, the other was the son of Bobbis, and a theologian, teacher of Pythagoras. Eratosthenes, however, says that there was only one Pherecides of Cyros, the other Pherecides being an Athenian and a genealogist. There is preserved a work by Pherecides of Cyros, a work which begins thus. Zeus and time and earth were from all eternity, and earth was called Chi, because Zeus gave her earth, Chi, as Gurdon, Cheras. His sundial is also preserved in the island of Cyros. Doris, in the second book of his Ori, gives the inscription of his tomb as follows. All knowledge that a man may have had I, yet tell Pythagoras where more thereby, that first of all Greeks is he, I speak no lie. Ion of Caio says of him, With manly worth endowed and modesty, though he be dead, his soul lives happily. If wise Pythagoras indeed saw light, and read the destinies of men aright. There is also an epigram of my own in the Pherecratian meter. The famous Pherecides to whom Cyrus gave birth, when his former beauty was consumed by vermin, gave orders that he should be taken straight to the Magnesian land, in order that he might give victory to the noble Ephesians. There was an oracle which he alone knew, enjoining this, and there he died among them. It seems, then, it is a true tale. 
If anyone is truly wise, he brings blessings both in his lifetime and when he is no more. He lived in the 59th Olympiad. He wrote the following letter. Letter of Pherecydes to Tallis. May yours be a happy death when your time comes. Since I received your letter, I have been attacked by disease. I am infested with vermin and subject to a violent fever with shivering fits. I have therefore given instructions to my servants to carry my writing to you after they have buried me. I would like you to publish it, provide that you and the other sages approve of it, and not otherwise. For I myself am not yet satisfied with it. The facts are not absolutely correct, nor do I claim to have discovered the truth, but merely such things as one who inquires about the gods pick up. The rest be thought out, for mine is all guesswork. As I was more and more weighed down with my malady, I did not permit any of the physicians or my friends to come into the room where I was, but, as they stood before the door and inquired how I was, I thrust my finger through the handhold and showed them how plague-stricken I was, and I told them to come tomorrow to bury Pherecydes. So much for those who were called the sages, with whom some writers also class Pisistratus the tyrant. I must now proceed to the philosophers and start with the philosophy of Ionia. Its founders was Thales, and Anaximander was his pupil. End of Pherecydes End of Book 1 of Lives of the Eminent Philosophers by Diogenes Laertius This translation was published in the Loeb Classical Library.